Well, welcome, family, to Transformation Church. Whether you are in the house or you're in South Carolina or you're in South Korea, wherever you are, we want you to know that you are welcome here. And so right now, we'd like to extend a special welcome to all of our Correctional Facility Partnerships. And uh, we mentioned this during the music, but if you are interested in getting the sermon notes, there is a QR code on the seat in front of you, and you can get it there, or you can go to the TC app, or if you're watching online, uh, the host will give you a link. Yes, our communications team did a great job of putting these, uh, a QR code on the back of your seat, so open up your camera app, boom, right there. So for you people who are left brain, you like to take Logical notes, by the way, I love when you DM me those on Instagram. If you're over 16, you don't know what DM is, ask your grandchild <laughs> to direct message. But it also saves us money when we can do it digitally. And so instead of printing paper, we can actually feed people with that extra money. Y'all feeling what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. <laughs> totally. So um, I'm Pastor Derwin. This is my bride, Vicki, who looks incredibly lovely today. I just have to say that. That's not just for points. I mean, it's just true, but it's always good to be with her. We are continuing our series, Holy Habits, and we're going to talk about the holy habits of a, of a, of a royal priest, is you are a peacemaker. Now, I want you to think about this. If you are a teenager, if you're a preteen, uh, put this in your spirit early, and everybody else, grab a hold of this, right? Our life is the sum of our daily habits. Our life is the sum of our daily habits. And one of the things that dark powers want to do, one of the things that our, even our culture wants to do is to put us on autopilot so we actually don't think about the thoughts that we think. Oh, y'all didn't catch that. That we don't think about the thoughts that we actually think. And so the scene of the crime is your, we're going to learn holy habits so that we can live lives that are holy. Now, depending upon your background, if you have some church background, for some pe people, holiness means like women can't wear pants or women can't put on makeup. And let me just put on a soapbox really quick. Why is it that in fundamentalist religions, it's always women that got to carry the bag? Have you, ever, have you ever noticed that? It's like, women, you have to cover yourselves up so, so we won't lust. That's not their problem, that's your problem. <laughs> Hello. It's really, it's really strange how women are handicapped, right? Nah. But holiness means this. The holiness is of God is God's otherness. He, he, he is so distinct. He, he is so different. He, he, he is so beautiful. And what makes him beautiful and holy and distinct is that he is the embodiment of love. First John 4 eight says that God is love. Holiness is not something to fear. Holiness is the beauty of God reflected in the all-encompassing nature of his infinite love. And what does God want to do? He wants to make us holy as well so that we can be loving. The Bible's very clear, clear. You will know my disciples because they argue with people on Facebook about vaccinations. You will know my people because they use big old theological words. You will know my people because they love one another. Love is sacrificial, not sentimental. Love is deep waters that Jesus wants us to swim in. So watch this. We're going to learn holy habits so that we can live a holy life. Holy habits are intentional, Jesus-centered rhythms and decisions empowered by the Holy Spirit that showcase our allegiance to God, his church, and his mission of reckoning. Ciliation. Let, let me explain this. This is so important. The church is not this wonderful building 
This building houses the church. The church gathers and then the church scatters. The word church simply means ecclesia or the assembly. People called out of something into something. We've been called out of darkness into light. So Transformation Church is a little speck of dust in God's big old global church. You have brothers and sisters in Afghanistan and Iran and North Korea and China and Fort Mill. We are a part of something that's massive and big, and so we want to develop holy habits to show our allegiance to God, to his church, and his mission of reconciliation. What does that mean? Teenagers, reconciliation means this. There's a divorce, and one person moves to another to heal and to restore the relationship. That God is saying, dear world, I want to be in covenant relationship with you so much so that I'm gonna send my son to enter into your mess. Think about how ridiculous the gospel is. We make a mess of God's creation and God says, I'll come clean it up. Mm. God says, I'll come and do it. Um, Have you guys watched the show, um, The Chosen? It's like on an app, it's about stories of Jesus. I mean, it is absolutely phenomenal. And one of the stories which was so awesome, it was was epic. They were talking about how to be holy for God. And one of the female characters, I I think it was Mary Magdalene, um, she says to the men disciples, Jesus did not come because we were holy. He came to make us holy. Mm. Family, that's it. God does in us and through us what we could never, ever do for ourselves. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about royal priests are peacemakers. And being a peacemaker is very different than being a peacekeeper. And so I can relate to this so deeply because uh, when we first got married, and really my whole life up until then, um, I really didn't know how to handle conflict. I didn't really know how to engage conflict well. And my understanding of like keeping the peace was just don't say anything. And that really wasn't keeping the peace. (laughs) That was like a false peace. And so, I remember we'd probably been married, I don't know, 14, 15 years by this point. Okay, let me pause here. So hear what we just said. We we had been married 14 or 15 years at this point. So listen, I love the Instagram pictures and you got engaged, that's awesome, but please hear our hearts. Spend more money on premarital counseling than you do on a photographer for Instagram. Like please, like, 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 listen to some people that have been together and married almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, we're talking year 14, and we're just figuring things out. Yeah. And so, um, I was sharing with a close friend of mine, and I was like, I'm just frustrated, and I need you- At me. At at him. I mean, I didn't share, like, details. (laughs) But I was like, you know, I'm frustrated. Just, you know, pray for me. And and she said- um, well, what are you gonna say? And I just was like, well, I'm not gonna say anything. I was like, I'm not gonna say anything. And she just looked at me and she was like, why wouldn't you say anything? And it was like, (laughs) scales fell from my eyes at that point is all I can say is I had this moment of clarity of like, why wouldn't I say anything? Like, how do I expect him to know what I'm thinking or feeling if I don't say something? And it was funny because at the point, I mean, I don't know, did I just think he could read my mind? I honestly don't know what I thought. And I'm clueless. I'm thinking everything's great. I just don't have a clue. And I'm sure at that point, now it was a long time ago, y'all, but I'm sure I pulled the passive aggressive. What's wrong? I'm fine. If you hear I'm fine, you're probably not fine. And so, um, so I had to learn how to navigate conflict. Like, we're not born knowing how to navigate conflict. You do know that, right? Like, we either learn it by um, default, by like observing how somebody else handles it, or somebody teaches us how to handle it. And so early on, we had to learn how to navigate conflict because we needed to learn to become peacemakers, not peacekeepers. Yeah, so enabling 
dysfunctional habits and suppressing how you feel is actually creating more discord, more division, more hurt. One of the things that I've said for years is this, is, is if you don't pay that bill right now, the interest will get you at the end. Yeah, yeah. So also give yourself a break, right? Give, you, give yourself a break, and here's why. Typically, we learn how to resolve conflict by what we see in our families. Now, what I'm about to say at the nine o'clock, people laughed, and I didn't mean it for people to laugh, but I grew up in an environment where you cuss each other out, you talk about things, people pull guns, you get it out. Now, nothing gets resolved or healed, but then you just move on. And so she came from an environment where you say something and you just walk out of the room. So early on, she'd say something, slam the door, walk out of the room, and I'm behind her. Yeah, and it, yeah. and it just, we were, we were rewriting what we had already seen. And Jesus is going, no, no, there's a better way. Mm -hmm. There's a more beautiful way. Let mm -hmm. me teach you. Matthew 5, 9 says this, blessed, and the word blessed is the Greek word makros, and it literally means happy. Happy are the peacemakers. Happier people who learn how to engage in conflict. Uh, here's a Derwin Gray Hebrew translation. You will be very unhappy by not engaging conflict because the conflict is going to swallow you up. Mm. Mm -hmm. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now watch this, for they will be called sons of God. Now this word sons of God is gender inclusive to men and female. The term son of God is a Hebrew term for God's lovingness of his children. It doesn't mean women become men. And it, just like men are called the bride of Christ, women are called the sons of God. It's a term of endearment. But what God is saying is this, is, is you will know my people because they go into conflict with hearts to make peace. They don't ignore conflict. They go into it peaceably. So we're gonna look at five ways to resolve conflict and, and we're continuing to work through these things. Now, contrary to my children when they were teenagers, it, it's, a, it's amazing how much smarter Vicky and I have gotten since our kids have become adults. Y'all didn't catch that. <laughs> teenagers are like, what's he talking about? <laughs> a lot of times our kids will be like, now I see what you're talking about. So contrary to teenagers, I was a senior in 1988. I played at a high school called Converse Judson right outside of San Antonio, Texas. I was nominated a team captain. I was one of the best players on one of the best teams in the state. And pride always leads to entitlement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Family, we're not even entitled to the next breath we breathe. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. a gift of God's mm -hmm. grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm feeling pretty good about myself, and I decided to miss practice because I didn't want to go. I was tired. At my high school, if you miss practice, you had better been abducted by aliens. <laughs> so I show up next day to practice. I'm not second string. I'm not third. I'm like fourth string. I'm like behind freshmen. So we go into the game, and I'm like, yeah, let me see what they're going to do without me. <laughs> we won 41 nothing. <laughs> Listen to this. 10 out of the 11 starters on defense in my high school played college football and four of us played in the NFL. They didn't need me. So the following week, Mike Sullivan, my high school coach, after our team meeting, asked the younger guys to leave the room and it was just me and him. And that man looked at me and he just started weeping. And I didn't, I didn't see men cry. I didn't think it was possible for him to cry. He was an old school coach. And he's weeping and he looks at me and he grabs his hands and he says, Dewey, you have so much potential, but I am not gonna let you play if you don't give me your all. I love you too much for you not to be the best that you can be. And back then, I didn't cry at all. I cry all the time now. But back then, I didn't cry. And all of a sudden, just a flood. And I thought to myself, this man loves me this much that he wants me to be the best that I can be and not be a prideful, entitled something. So he wipes the tears from his eyes. And he says, hey, wipe your tears because those guys down there respect you. 
The next week at practice, I'm still fourth string, but my goodness, I am killing my teammates. Greg, it's illegal what I'm doing to them kids. And then when we got that going. That means he was playing really good. Yeah, oh yeah, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry, because some of y'all may not be like, was Derwin pulling out a gat? Was he busting caps? No, no, no. That means I was playing really, really good. Caucasian translation. That's the Caucasian translation. That's the beauty of a multi-ethnic marriage. The white people were like, what kind of church is this? We have Ill- illegal galaxies going on. So anyway, in practice, I'm playing really good. Then we get to the game and we start the game and I'm still on the bench. And after the first play, Coach Sullivan says, Dewey, get in the game. I was never the same. I mean, it was just, I played so good. The rest of the year I played good, became first team all state, eventually got a scholarship and whatever things get tough, I remember that moment. I remember being in the NFL games in that moment. I remember when Vicky went through cancer in 2004 in that moment. I remember the high school game when my son broke his leg. I remember that moment. You see, that's what love is. Love is not letting you languish. Love is not letting you slumber and not being the best you can be. Love is entering into conflict. So this sermon is going to help you in your marriage. This sermon is going to help you in your parenting. It's going to help you in your friendships. It's going to help you in your dating and your co-workers if we are willing to let God move. Yeah, yeah. So um, the first way is we enter the conflict with gospel-shaped confidence and hope. So I'm trying to learn to ask myself if I'm entering into a conflict, am I coming in to prove I'm right or am I coming into the conflict to resolve it, to heal the relationship and to honor God? So last week we talked about the holy habit of all of life is worship. And what we mean by that is um, when you are in Christ Everything you do can be an act of worship. Everything you do can honor God. And so even entering into conflict can be an act of worship. So what does that look like? Well, for us, um, we've had to learn that conflict means we lovingly have a dialogue. Now it might get heated, but we don't call names. We don't degrade each other. Um, We try to like do some other things that have worked well for us, um, like just start laughing or something. But, um, but the bottom line is, is it requires humility, right? But what is, what's our heart? When we go into it, are we wanting to honor God or are we, are we wanting to get our way? Uh, let's read James 3, 16 through 18. It says, for where there is envy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom from above, that means from God, is first pure, then peace-loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without pretense. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who cultivate peace. Yeah. And so when we listen to those words, that, that is incredibly lofty. And also... You and I can't do it. Notice what the scripture says, but, and if you've been around it for a while, whenever you see but in the Bible, something big is about to happen because God loves big buts and he cannot lie. Watch this, but, here comes a big but, but the wisdom from above. So God is not asking you to do it. As a matter of fact, that's why he gives us grace because we can't do it. He goes, Dewey, think about it. You grew up in a context, people loved you as best they could, but it was so dysfunctional. I had no clue how to be a husband. I had no clue how to work through uh, um, conflict resolution. I had no clue, but God is going, but I'll give you my wisdom, son. It's going to take time. But notice this, but the wisdom from above is first pure. It's, I don't want to win an argument. I don't want to be right. I want healing and harmony. That's what we want to want. That's what we want to want. Then peace loving, gentle, compliant, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering without pretense. 
So watch this. Number two, five ways to resolve conflict. Number two is this. Talk to them, not about them to other people. Talk to them, not about other people to them. This is the standard mode of operation of how we do life is I got a problem with a person, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go tell another person about the person I have a problem with and not even tell the person. Family, that's immaturity, and that's so dangerous. The Bible calls that slander, and slander is on the level of all types of sexual immorality. The book of James says that your tongue literally can cause a fire. You can, mm-hmm. you can burn down people. Mm-hmm. You want to you, you, you talk to them, not about them. Now, there's a difference between seeking wisdom, but you know when you have no intention of actually going to that person. Let's look what Jesus says. Now, Jesus says important things. Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 17, he says this, if your brother sins against you, go tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he won't listen, take one or two others with you so that by the testimony of two or three witnesses, every fact may be established. If he doesn't pay attention to them, tell the church. If he doesn't pay attention to even The church, let him be like a Gentile and a tax collector to you. Lord, have mercy. Jesus went off. Some are like, pastor, what do you mean Jesus went off? Let me give you a little cultural context of what Jesus is doing. Jesus is a Jewish man of the Jewish people. Gentiles were the non-Jews who had occupied Jesus' people for a long time. And right now, it was the Romans. The Romans were godless, sexually immoral. They were, they were pagans. And so Jesus is saying, listen, if there's not humility and repentance, they're acting like people who don't even follow God. And then he says, a tax collector. You're like, what's wrong with the IRS? I work for the IRS. No, that's not what's happening here. What's happening here is tax collector were Jewish people who would take taxes from Jews to give to the Romans who were the enemies. Let me give you another picture. It would be like in slavery days, an enslaved black person taking taxes from enslaved black people and giving it to the masters of the plantation. They are selling out their own people. And so tax collectors were considered actually worse than the Gentiles. That's how important working through conflict actually is. Number three, don't blame, explain, and be specific. So one of the things that I've figured out about myself is that I'm an internal processor and he's an external processor. So if anything happens, whether it's good, bad, ugly, he right away will call me or, hey, this happened. And while he's talking about it, he's like figuring out how he feels about it. I'm literally the opposite. Like, I don't know if my brain and my mouth don't work at the same time, which is pretty dangerous, but sometimes if we're in the midst of talking, I'm like, I don't even know how I feel about this. Like, I don't even know what I'm thinking right now. And so, because I'm an internal processor, what I've had to learn to do, and I'm I'm not kidding you guys, this is probably like year, I don't know, 15, 20, when I figured this one out. A little bit of a slow learner. Um, Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. (laughs) Let, let, Let me stop. She has a tendency to beat herself up, and so today we just, we just no, you're not beating yourself up. Your mouth and your brain works very fine. And you're not a slow learner. So no more of this stuff. Okay. No, okay. uh-uh, no more, Vicki Gray. No, this woman is valedictorian in high school, valedictorian in college. She practically ran this church to plant this church. She created the first website. No, 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 no more. No more. Seriously. Thank you. No, Thank no, you. no, seriously, because she did that the first time, and uh, the Holy Spirit's like, you going to say something? I was like, nope. <laughs> I'm going to do opposite of the sermon we're preaching. <laughs> no, but seriously, so <clears throat> as we work through this, what I had to learn is 
She's more thoughtful in what she says, and so she needs time to journal and to think about those things. It doesn't mean, just because I can come up with stuff fast doesn't mean that it's different or uh, that it's better than her. It's just God took two opposites, and so as I've learned how to let her process, I can drink from her wisdom, and then there are times where I'm speaking fast, Mm -hmm. she can drink from my wisdom. Uh, and I okay. receive that. You Thank receive you. The, okay. I do. Okay. That's my perfectionism that we talked about last week um, coming through. So uh, but what I've realized is if I don't stop and say, I do want to talk about this. I just can't do it right now because I'm not sure how I feel. Um, then what happens is I just start blaming because I go into like protection, self-defense mode, right? And I just start like, well, you do this and you do that. And that's not helping anybody. And so We've gotten into the habit now where I'll say, I know this is an issue we need to address. Um, let me take some time, you take some time, let's go away, pray, et cetera, and then we'll come back like, I don't know, tonight, tomorrow, whatever time it is, and, mm-hmm. and then we'll talk about it because I know I'll overreact. Mm-hmm. And so part of that for me is learning to love myself correctly, yes. that what I have to say is valuable. Yes. And what I think and what I feel mm-hmm is valuable, Mm -hmm. and it's okay that it takes me more time. In fact, one time we got into an argument, (laughs) this one, I mean, a few years ago, and it was when he was getting his master's, I think, and he was using all kind of- It took me a few years to get over getting a master's degree, by the way. (laughs) He was was using all kind of big words and stuff, and I just was like, just because you're using big words doesn't mean you're right. (laughs) And I was just so frustrated. I didn't have anything else to say. And I think at that point, um, we called Pastor Tim and Pastor Paul, who planted the church with us, and put them on speaker. And I was like, this is what he's doing. And um, and we needed needed their wisdom. We needed someone to walk alongside us and really help us navigate through um, a complicated issue because we were we were both just being stubborn, right? And so being specific is helpful. And a lot of times when I'm um, processing, and I usually journal to process my prayers because I don't know, God just like speaks to me that way. And I can often um, pick up what the underlying issue really is. But if I just like respond right away, it's actually probably not even the real issue. It's more of like a behavior that has just irritated me or something like that. Yeah, and, and you know, that's one of the blessings of having Pastor Paul and Pastor Tim is they've been married a long, I mean, they were around when Noah built the ark. So, you know, <laughs> they know some things. <laughs> question, question, who are the older, old school people that speak life over you? I mean, we're on the phone going back and forth and it was so ridiculous, Pastor Tim started laughing and so they helped us through it, but there's, there's wisdom in having people with wisdom hair to yeah. inform you. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, babe. Hebrews 12, 14 and 15 says, pursue peace with everyone, so that's, that's basically a command. Like, as much as it depends on you, make peace mm-hmm. and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. Mm-hmm. Make sure that no one falls short of the grace of God mm-hmm. and that no root of bitterness springs up, causing trouble and defiling many. Yeah, yeah, that, that, is, that is so important. Bitter roots are very destructive. For those of you who know me fairly well, if you don't, um, I love lawns. Matter of fact, on sabbatical, I actually did some landscaping around the house and was doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And one of the things that I noticed is in our flower beds, there were weeds. Now, the problem is weeds are green, grass is green, but if you allow weeds to continue to grow, they will take over the good grass and it'll destroy the lawn, it'll destroy the flower beds, and what happens is, is when we do not pursue seeking peace, guess what happens in that vacuum? Lots of weeds growing. At first, the weeds look like grass, but then they actually begin to destroy grass. Here's a question, how many weeds have you allowed to grow? I got some really good news though, y'all. So, when Jesus rose from the dead, Mary was at the tomb because all the men were afraid and hiding. Can we give it up for the, hey, ladies? (laughs) Mary 
Mary was there. The men were hiding. And Jesus had rose from the dead. She's like, where is my Lord's body? And then Mary mistaken Jesus for what? A gardener. Guess what Jesus does? He loves to pull up weeds. Will you let him, will you let him beautify your garden? Will you, will you let him pull up some weeds, some generational curses? Will you let him pull them up? Because he's a good gardener. He's a great gardener. He will de-weed your lawn and your flower beds. He'll do it. Trust me, we know. And he's still pulling up weeds. Number four, tell the person that you want that you're in conflict with, tell them you want peace and harmony. Tell them, I want peace with you. I, I want harmony with you. Now, this is very important, friends. This is very important, family. Sometimes peace and harmony means I can't be in a relationship with you because you are hurting me too much. I want to be sensitive, but I want to help us. I want to help me. Years ago, a person very, very close to me, I had to get to the point to say, I love you and I will always love you, but you are hurting me in my heart. can't bear it anymore. I just can't do it. If you are unwilling to change, I cannot let you continue to hurt me. If I get off the phone with you and my mood has changed and I got anxiety in my stomach and I'm hurting and I'm weeping and I'm depressed, that's codependency and you are hurting me. God has not called us to enable dysfunction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it wasn't until I said that, that that particular person's life actually began to change. It actually began to change. Now, let me say this. If you are in an abusive relationship verbally and physically, God does not call, call you to stay in that relationship. Right. Listen, listen. Sadly, the term in Scripture, God hates divorce, has been taken out of context. God is talking to the nation of Israel. He describes the nation of Israel as his wife, just as the church is described as the bride of Christ. God does not require anybody to stay in a physically or verbally abusive relationship. Right. That is not love. And listen, it is not just men who abuse verbally and physically. Oh, that's right. It works right. the other way as well. Yeah. That is not love, and you are to not stand that or to tolerate that. Peace is saying, I can no longer let you break me into pieces. I'm going to let Jesus make me whole, and I got to go. Yeah. Amen. And isn't it ironic that people who tend to use that verse are the ones who are abusing that's of the devil, it's dark. And we cast that out in the name of Jesus. And I want you to know that God can heal you. God can change mm -hmm. you. God mm -hmm. can transform you. God mm -hmm. wants to do it and he's able. He's just looking for hearts to say, here I am. Yeah. Number five, yeah. pray for those you are engaged in conflict with. Romans 12, nine through 14 says, let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil, cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Take the lead in honoring one another. Do not lack diligence and zeal. Be fervent in the spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in affliction. Be persistent in prayer. Share with the saints in their needs. Pursue hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So that's like bless your enemies, basically. And so the reality is, I can't do this in my own power, and you can't do it in your own power. We need Jesus to do it in us and through us. Now, praying for those who, you, who either hurt you or you consider your enemy, it doesn't mean you're going to feel like doing it. It's an act of obedience, okay? And so some people will say, well, that just makes you a hypocrite. Well, let me ask you this question. When your alarm clock goes off in the morning, mm. 
and you don't want to get out of bed, but you do, does that make you a hypocrite? Or does it make you a responsible adult? Mm. So here, God is saying, bless those who persecute you. So pray for those who hurt you as an act of obedience and trust me with what I do with it, regardless of what you feel. Yeah, amen. It, you know, uh, this wasn't a part of the message what I'm gonna share, but the Spirit of God prompted me, and so I'm gonna share at this service as well, particularly about blessing those who have persecuted you, blessing those who have hurt you. Um, and I have to be sensitive with the story I'm gonna share, but I, I, I think as adults and young adults, we can grab a hold to it. But when I was probably about six, I was taken advantage of by an o older um, teenage boy. And so if you look at statistics, one out of five males, that happens to, one out of four women, that happens to. If you do the math of the thousands of people watching online and all the people that are here, there is a lot of us. As a matter of fact, in between services, I got a, a DM on Instagram saying, I just shared with my wife something that happened to me 33 years ago. Thank you for giving me the courage to share. Um, what happens is, is when you experience that type of trauma without Jesus, is you try to overcome the trauma with your accomplishments. You try to overcome the trauma with what you do. And it's, the word picture I have is, it's, it's like taking a shovel and you're digging a hole because you're working and you think the dirt that you're working for is gonna overcome the trauma, overcome the pain, and before you know it, you're in a six-foot grave and you can't even get out. Mm. It wasn't until August 2nd, 1997, that that began to change because I met him. I met Jesus. And Jesus told me, son, I love you. Son, I forgive you. And all the pain that you've ever experienced that was sent to break you, I'm gonna use it to, to make you. It wasn't my will for that to happen to you, but my will is gonna do something that's gonna change you forever. Mm. And then over the years, I found myself actually praying for the person who did that to me. And here's the thing, praying for that person may not have changed them, but praying for that person changed me. Yes, yeah. That's real, that's so real. Hey family, listen, if we don't resolve conflict and love each other, we're no different than the world. We're no different from the world. What's the point? Sing good songs, hear a good message, and go home and eat each other and devour each other like wolves. What's the point? We didn't plan a church to be a big church. We just want people to love each other. That's all. That's all. Just love and forgive. That's all. That's all we've ever wanted. Our worship teams are gonna come out and play and are gonna sing Build My Life. And would you let God just do what he needs to do? Weeds need to be pulled up. Would you just let him do it? And then Vicki and I will come back out and we're gonna lead us in a time of prayer. We could. 
Father, thank you. Thank you that you did not avoid conflict resolution. Your heart for us and to resolve conflict resulted in the cross, that on the cross, forgiveness, the removal of condemnation, shame, and guilt has been vanquished. That upon the cross, reconciliation can take place. That on the cross, walls can be torn down. That on the cross, healing takes place. And Lord, but the cross is not all you did. On the third day, you rose from the tomb and said, I want to build your life on me. That Jesus is the chief cornerstone and that we can build our lives on him. So Lord, I want to pray right now. Many of us have various issues of conflict and work and, and family and friends or whatever it may be. May we be peacemakers. May we walk into conflict with gospel confidence and hope. May we do so and pursue righteousness and love. May we be known as a people that love each other, enter into difficulty with the hope of reconciliation and restoration and healing. Right now, there are those who are physically here and there are those who are watching. I believe that it is many of you and your eyes have been opened. That you want Jesus, that that you want his gift of salvation, you want his gift of love, you want him to heal your heart, you want to experience his reconciliation, you want to enter his peace. Listen, tomorrow's not guaranteed, nor is the next day, nor next week. Today is your day to say yes to Jesus. I'm ready to follow you. Today is your moment to call his name and say, I want you to be my savior. I want you to be my king. I'm ready to be loved by you. I'm ready to be forgiven. I'm ready to have a new start. I'm ready to have a new life. I can't do this anymore, God. Today, I want you. If that's you in the silence of your heart, just say this. He's listening, he's present. Say this, Lord Jesus, I believe that on that cross, you resolved the conflict I had between you and your daddy. That upon that cross, that that precious blood forgave me, that, that precious blood makes me new, that precious blood draws me to the Father's heart. And I believe that on the third day, when you defeated death, I walked out of that tomb with you. I'm a new creation. I'm a part of your family. I am a peacemaker. I've got a new hope and a new future and a new power. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this gift. It's in your glorious name we pray. And God's people said amen and amen. Can we give God a round of applause? Can we let him know that we appreciate him? Can we let our applause raise to the heavens? Amen and amen. What I want us to do before we go into our soul tattoo and action step, if you're watching by TV at, at home, open up your camera app of your phone, point it at the TV, it's gonna go to our QR code, you'll see it, that'll take you to the connection card. If you're here physically, we want you to fill out the connection card. Last week, 20 people gave their life to Jesus. So we wanna know, we wanna applaud, we wanna pray for you and with you, so let us know that you made that decision to follow Jesus. So here's our soul tattoo. You ready? It's deep. Go be a peacemaker. And the action step is to um, get into a small group, a TC group, and talk about the conversation guide, which we'll talk about this message. And um, here at Transformation Church, our groups are multi-ethnic and multi-generational. And it is a great opportunity to practice peacemaking with brothers and sisters that are different from us. And what's what's the big idea? What's the why? Because the world is watching how we live. Yeah. And so don't be surprised if people have different opinions and perspectives than you. That's not when you run. That's when you run to each other to learn from each other. Yeah. 
We love you guys. Can you welcome Pastor Curtis and Lord of Triceps? <laughs> Man, what an incredible message. Did you guys enjoy that? Yeah. I know I did, most definitely. Amazing, what an amazing message. It felt like a therapy session straight from the scripture. I know that's what it felt like for me. I just wanna thank you guys for attending with us today. Um, just a credible way we can worship together. Uh, in this way, but as well as through our generosity giving as well. So I know you guys heard Pastor Curtis and I talking earlier. So through your generosity giving, we've been able to give $40,000 just in Haiti, Afghanistan, as well as here locally. Yeah, clap it up for that. That's amazing. And so those types of ways that you guys have been giving faithfully, even during a pandemic, giving faithfully, allowing Transformation Church to be able to be the hands and feet of Jesus physically as well as spiritually as well. So as you guys will be able to see on the screens, we have multiple ways you guys can give via text to give as well as via the app. So if you don't have the app, download the app so you can give as well that way. I'm going to pray for us right quick. Will you join me? Dear really Father, oh God, we just thank you. It is because of your love, your grace, your mercy that we are learning and being molded and shaped into peacemakers, Father God. Walking your earth with your Holy Spirit, leading us and guiding us, being able to lead and reach people for your glory and for your namesake. And we don't take it lightly. And so we thank you for that opportunity because in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We got, yes, yes. special announcements a special moment. this yes. morning. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> special announcement. Uh, Mr. Greg Cox, can you come up here? Can, uh, Greg is our music producer. Can y'all can y'all give it up for uh, Mr. Greg Cox? So, um, so we have a special announcement, and these announcements are like happy, sad, right? So um, Greg has been just phenomenal here at Transformation Church over in the warehouse. For those of you who may not know, we used to be in a little old bitty warehouse with AstroTurf in it, and Greg came to us as an agnostic. He and KJ have known each other for years. KJ actually, Pastor K K KJ actually led him to the Lord in one of our little rooms at the old warehouse back in 2014. Yeah. And so in 2015, I had the honor and privilege to be able to baptize him. And uh, Greg is incredibly gifted. He's, 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 he's grown immensely. And uh, he is going to be taking a position at Celebration Church in Jacksonville, Florida. They got campuses like literally all over the world. And he's gonna be able to take what he's learned here and just spread it. But also, now this is, this is just me. I've been telling this for years. I'm like, you are so much more doper than Kanye West. <laughs> no, for real. He don't believe me, but I believe it. So he's also gonna impact uh, the musical genre, I call him the positive prophet because he's speaking what we're teaching here but putting it in a language that people can understand. And man, I am so, we are so proud of you. We are proud of you, we're grateful for you. And um, Like, this isn't like goodbye, this is like eagle, go fly. Eagle, go fly. So man, we're gonna lift you up and just thank, can y'all extend your hands towards him? Father, we just lift up Greg. Um, we thank you for the incredible work you've done in his life that you will do in his life. And as he enters this next phase of his journey, may he love you like never before. May he be stretched and challenged like never before. And Lord, may he practice your presence like never before. And may he be a conduit of your mercy and kindness in such a way that Jesus is exalted, that this celebration church will celebrate Jesus more because of Greg and his walk with Christ. Bless him to be an incredible father. 
Bless him to be a father that sacrifices for his children, yes. that they see Jesus in him. Yes. Let him be a man that is not distracted by the distractions, but that is attracted to Jesus in the midst of it. Yes. Lord, take him and bless him and keep him. And God's people said, amen, amen, amen and amen. amen. Proud of you, man.